In 2003, the Human Genome Project released a report on its findings. I wonder how many people were satisfied with that report. When I heard it, I laughed at it. We were told that the learned scientists could not understand the vast majority of the genetic code, which must, therefore, be meaningless. The small selection of the code which they could understand represented protein sequences. Vast quantities of protein sequences representing enormous quantities of information. Based on this understanding of the genetic code and a willingness to justify cooking the books to suit their theories, they told us that chimpanzees and man shared 97% of all their genes, proving without a doubt that man must have evolved from chimps. When the ENCODE project proved that the meaningless junk DNA, which the scientists could not understand, was actually an operating program which directed the cells how to use the protein sequences. Many, like Richard Dawkins, raged and stormed against the idea and said it was rubbish. They raged and stormed against Fred Hoyle, who applied a real scientific mind to the problem and wrote, The notion that not only the biopolymers, but the operating program of a living cell could be arrived at by chance is evidently nonsense of a high order. Hoyle was not popular for pointing out what they desperately were trying to ignore. Life cannot be explained without an operating program, and that requires a programmer. Lee Spetner, a brilliant biological physicist, who became hated by the evolutionists all over the world for his analysis that evolution is not able to explain life, he pointed out that, among other things, there are genetic switches which direct organisms to various paths of development. Perhaps those unfamiliar with computer programming might not be familiar with the idea of switches. All but the simplest programs have a decision-making structure which enables the program to do different things depending on different circumstances. In its simplest form, it looks like this. If one set of conditions, then perform procedure A. Else, if a second set of conditions, then perform procedure B, and so on for as many different sets of conditions as are required. An everyday example could be, if it's snowing, then put on fur-lined boots. Else, if it's raining, then get out your umbrella. Now, blue gum trees are native to Australia. More than a hundred years ago, seeds of the blue gum tree were taken to South Africa. The trees look different to those in Australia. I've heard Australians deny that they are blue gums. But if you take the seeds from the South African blue gums back to Australia, they grow to be just like the Australian trees. When the seeds germinate, the switches are apparently set depending on the kind of soil, soil water and so on. Now, many observations have been made of the beaks of Galapagos finches. In wet years, when there are soft seeds and fruits, the new generation appears with small beaks well suited to the soft food. But when dry years come, the beaks are bigger stronger and better suited to crack the hard, tough seeds available. Rosemary and Peter Grant spent about 40 years on one of the Galapagos Islands, observing the finches. They bubbled over about being able to see the evolution of beaks before their very eyes. But the change in beak design that they saw, backwards and forwards, 
in step with rainfall patterns has nothing to do with evolution. It has everything to do with the if-then-else code in their operating programs. The evolutionists have been doing lots of very detailed research on genetic code, and that research has become a huge embarrassment to evolution. Have you thought about why we hear so little now about evolution? Well, little that is new, that is. We still have the same old dogmatic claims that evolution is a fact, and Darwin is solidly proved beyond doubt, but in fact, the obvious clever programming in the genetic code is becoming blatantly obvious. But what Spetner called genetic switches, the kind of if-then-else coding that we looked at, is being called plasticity, presumably to hide its obvious connection with programming. The genetic code is not predictable. There can be different responses depending on different circumstances. The response is plastic. That at least makes it sound less like programming. But there has been a really embarrassing demonstration of the kind of object-oriented program I mentioned in the response to Dawkins episode. It's called the Developmental Genetic Toolkit. It's a small collection of genes which control the development of embryos. A set of genes which is common to all types of creatures in every phylum of the animal kingdom. So, whether you are a whale, or a jellyfish, or a rabbit, or a snail, or a crab, or a crocodile, or a starfish, or whatever, you have that set of genes in your DNA. And when you produce offspring, the embryos all develop in the early stages according to the code in that genetic toolkit. In a monkey's if-then-else coding, the first line might read, If you are a mollusk, then perform procedure mollusk. Well, that doesn't include monkeys, so we skip to the If you are a chordate, then perform procedure chordate. Monkeys do have a backbone, so we skip over to the chordate procedure. And when we've done all the steps necessary to get our backbone underway, we come to the next decision tree, which sorts us out into the right class of animals with backbones. If you are a bird, then perform procedure birds. No, that's not for monkeys. If you are a reptile, then perform procedure reptile. No, that's not for monkeys either. If you are a mammal, then perform procedure mammal. Right on. Monkeys are mammals, so over we go to the code for mammals. And so it goes on, from the general to the particular, until we reach the procedures for monkeys only, and then we skip out of the development toolkit and into the rest of the monkey DNA. This marvellous and interesting research is well known among the top evolutionists, but it's being hidden from the public. That's not surprising. It settles the creation-evolution controversy once and for all. The only way that could have happened is if the brilliant programmer of life planned out all the kinds of creatures he intended to make before he had made any of them. And then he did the object-orientated programs for each creature consistently from the very beginning. But evolutionists make a determined effort at obfuscation, and all the evidence for programming is hidden behind the name self-organization. But the evolutionists know that even that gives too much away. One can see the determination of hiding the truth displayed by Eugenie Scott, the originator of the National Centre for Science Education, which has nothing to do with science, 
and whose only aim is to prevent any suggestion of creation or intelligent design from entering American schools. She refuses to sanction any textbook mentioning self-organization because, she says, people would confuse it with intelligent design. Well, she's certainly right about that. Anyone presented with the research results without distracting obfuscation or smoke and mirrors will obviously recognise that all of it cries out intelligent design. For ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature and attributes, that is, his eternal power and divinity, have been made intelligible and clearly discernible in and through the things that have been made, his handiworks. So men are without excuse, altogether without any defence or justification, because when they knew and recognised him as God, they did not honour and glorify him as God, or give thanks but instead they became futile and godless in their thinking, with vain imaginings, foolish reasoning and stupid speculations, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, Please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.